All right. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. So looking at the list of speakers, it looks uh, like, you know, a lot of you are particle physicists. So, you know, if I haven't pitched this talk at the right level, or if you feel that, you know, anything that I say is not 100% clear, please feel free to interrupt in the middle. So also, because, you know, the way I have set up my screen, I'm doing this on the laptop, so uh, I'm not able to see all your faces. So just pipe up in the middle and interrupt me, and I will try to uh, clarify. So I'm going to tell you a very simple story. And this is work that I've done with my former student, Ankur Das, and my colleague, Prabhu Kaul, here at the University of Kentucky. And uh, it involves graphene uh, in a magnetic field at charge neutrality. So here's a outline. So I'll first talk about the basics of graphene, which I imagine are familiar to most of you, but perhaps not. So we'll go over it. And again, ask me to slow down if I'm going too fast. Then we'll talk about Landau levels in the presence of a magnetic field, a perpendicular magnetic field. And um, there's a small experimental puzzle about what the phase is in nu equals zero graphene, which is graphene in a perpendicular field as charge neutrality. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, I'll tell you one way to resolve this experimental question. And then we'll end with some open questions, some conclusions, some speculations, etc. All right, so let's begin. So graphene is a single sheet of carbon. It forms a honeycomb lattice. There are two types of sites. So let's just call them A sites and B sites in the unit cell, two sites per unit cell. And the simplest non-interacting Hamiltonian you can write down, which seems to be pretty much what graphene has in reality, is simply a nearest neighbor hopping between the two different neighboring sites. And if you find out the band structure that comes with that, it turns out that the Brillouin zone, which can also be written as a honeycomb, a hexagon, tilted by 90 degrees with respect to the spatial hexagon, it has two low energy points, and they are the corners of the Brillouin zone. They're called K and K prime. And at each of these corners, it turns out that the spectrum forms a Dirac cone. So at the moment, there's no spin involved. There's only a sub lattice index. So this is a two by two space consisting of A fermions and B fermions. And so they form a Dirac cone at the K point and exactly at the time reversed K prime point, which is minus K, there's another Dirac cone. And uh, pretty much that's it. Now, there are, of course, four other points in the Bilbon zone, but they're connected to these Dirac points by a reciprocal lattice vector. I wonder if I can annotate my own screen. I guess I can't. No, I can't. Let's see. Yes, I can. OK, great. So. These two points are connected by a reciprocal lattice vector. So let's call them G1 or something. And then, of course, those two points are connected by a reciprocal lattice vector and so on. So there are really only two different points at which you can have a Dirac cone in this Bell 1 zone. And that is what you have. OK. Now, we are talking about interacting graphene. So what kinds of interactions would graphene have? Well, of course, there would be a long range Coulomb interaction. And uh, this long range Coulomb interaction can be projected onto the low energy sector. And let's see what kinds of different things that it gives you when you think about the low energy effective theory, which consists of those two Dirac cones that I mentioned, the one at K and the one at K prime. And let's see what kinds of interactions we can get from Coulomb or perhaps even other lattice scale interactions. OK, so if you think about four Fermi interactions or two body interactions, pretty much what you have to do is you have to create a particle hole pair somewhere and another particle hole pair somewhere else and let them talk to each other. So C dagger C, C dagger C. 
Okay, so you can have the purple kind of interaction. And this purple kind basically says, I create the two particle hole pairs at the same valley. So by the way, these two Dirac cones are called valleys, the K valley and the K prime valley. So you create them in the same valley and that's either purple or green, okay? That corresponds to basically the kind of interaction that I call U0 in the H int. And then there's another kind where I can take I can make a purple particle hole pair and a green particle hole pair. So that if you take linear combinations of various kinds, you will find something that corresponds to a tau Z in the valley space. So the tau poly matrices act in the valley space. Okay, that is the A, B, the, the, the sorry, the, the, the valley space, which is going to become the sub lattice space in a minute. Okay, so that is a second kind of interaction. Now there's a third kind of interaction that also conserves momentum. And what you wanna do is you wanna, these are the orange lines that I've mentioned there. You take a particle from the K prime valley, put it into the K valley, conserving its spin. And then you do the reverse. You take another particle from the K valley and put it back into the K prime valley. So that conserves momentum and it conserves spin. So basically what Alice and Fisher pointed out in 2006 is that this leads to, you know, at least at the four Fermi level of interactions, this leads to a separate conservation of the number of particles in each valley. Okay, and you can sort of see that from the structure of what I've written down. And this leads to a U1 symmetry of this interacting Hamiltonian. So there's a U1 symmetry in the valley space is generated by the difference of number of particles of fermions in the two valleys. And then of course, the spin is an SU2. So that is the symmetry of the primordial interactions in graphene, at least at the four Fermi level. It turns out that if you go to six Fermi, you can take three particles from one valley and put them into another valley by an umklub process, because three times the difference of K and K prime is actually a reciprocal lattice vector. So that's possible, but it's at the six Fermi level. So we are gonna ignore it in whatever we talk about today. Okay, so now we've figured out how the non-interacting band structure looks like and what the interactions look like. And now let's talk about adding a magnetic field. So what happens? Well, you have these two Dirac cones and near each Dirac cone, you can write down the Dirac Landau levels. And um, you guys probably all know that these go like the square root of n, the spectrum goes like square root of n, and there is a positive part and a negative part of the spectrum. The spectrum is particle hole symmetric, and there is a zeroth Landau level. Okay, it's exactly at zero energy, and that's gonna be very important for us. Each of these Landau levels in this continuum picture has a churn number of minus one. In other words, it just looks like any other Landau level, say from some kind of semiconductor like Gallium arsenide. Okay, the zero Landau level has some special properties. One is that there's sub lattice valley locking. So in other words, if I look at the K valley the Landau level, the n equals zero Landau level that comes from the K valley has support, the wave function has support only on the A sub lattice. And in the K prime valley, it has support only on the B sub lattice. Okay, so that is called sub lattice valley locking. And that makes life actually very simple. So if you're projecting down to the n equals zero manifold of Landau levels, which let me remind you, consists of four. So there's a, there are two valleys and there are also two spins. Okay, so with those with that fourfold degeneracy, you don't need to include the sub lattice index. You can only include the valley index because of the sub lattice valley locking. So now let's imagine that we had a non-interacting system, non-interacting graphene, and I've put it in a perpendicular magnetic field. So along with this perpendicular magnetic field, 
which is an orbital effect. Of course, there's also a Zeeman effect. So there's a Zeeman energy, which I've called EZ, and that splits the levels of the upspin and the downspin, even at the one body level. So what it looks like in the bulk is what you see over on the left. So Landau level of this, this Dirac system is, is degenerate, just like any other Landau level in a clean system, degenerate in the bulk. And as you come near the edge, something a little peculiar happens. So the N equals zero Landau level, it turns out, is made up of an equal superposition of particle-like states and hole-like states. So if you want, you can imagine that, you know, here's your Dirac cone, and then, you know, there's some set of levels that are actually sucked into this n equals zero set of Landau levels, okay? And these levels have an equal superposition of particle and hole. So what happens near the edge is the particle-like levels disperse upwards. So those are the red lines that I show you towards the edge, going towards the edge. And then the whole like, there's some other superposition of this K and K prime, which is the whole like set of levels, and they actually disperse down. So those are the two green levels. So now imagine that you put your chemical potential in the bulk, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so somewhere here, this is your chemical potential. Then near the edge, you will see that there is one particle-like level that crosses the chemical potential and a whole like level that crosses it. And by taking DEDK, right, it turns out that in the Landau levels, this direction, which is towards the edge, let's call it X, is also the same as KY, okay? So if you take the group velocity, you'll see that the particle-like levels go into the page and the whole like levels come out of the page. And you can notice just from the labeling that the particle like levels have upspin and the whole like levels have downspin as they cross the chemical potential. Okay, so this is the non interacting picture. And this was pretty much the prediction for what this new equals zero graphene should look like. So, what is this new that we're talking about? So at particle hole symmetry, so remember all these Landau levels come fourfold degenerate. So in the early days when graphene was very dirty, what they could see, they could not discriminate between all these different Landau levels in the same N value. And so what they found was that if you plot it as a function of the gate voltage, if you plotted the sigma xy, then what you'd find is you'd find plus two, and then you would find minus two. And then as you gated it, it would suddenly jump to plus six. And then on the other side, it would jump to minus six and so on. So it would jump by four. And that's because you couldn't discriminate between all these different Landau levels. Later on, as the graphene started becoming cleaner and cleaner, you started seeing more and more steps. And then basically now, it's clean enough that you can see all these steps here. And so I'm talking about this step right there where I'm drawing my red dot, and that is at charge neutrality. And there are equal number, there's basically one particle per site built in the graphene. And that is called charge neutrality. That's also called nu equals one, sorry, nu equals zero. And that is the kind of graphene we are gonna be talking about. Okay, so the prediction from the non-interacting theory then, is that at nu equals zero, graphene should be fully polarized at least those two Landau levels, right? The K up and the K prime up should be filled. And near the edge, there should be a pair of conducting states, one going into the page with upspin and one coming out of the page with downspin. Okay, so I've just written out these conclusions here. And this is what was predicted by Abanin, Lee, and Levitov in 2006. What happens if you add Coulomb interactions? Nothing much, it turns out. Okay, so what happens is that these modes, which are now single particle modes in the non-interacting theory, 
basically get promoted to what are called helical Luttinger liquid, liquid edge modes. And that was the work of Brian Furtick. So the physical picture remains the same. The bulk is fully polarized and the edge is a helical Luttinger liquid. Okay, so now let's go to the experiment. So the first experiment was actually done in 2014 in, by Andrea Young in Pablo Jario Herrero's group. And what they did was they put a perpendicular field of about one and a half Tesla, and then they added in-plane fields. So what do the in-plane fields do? In-plane fields don't have any orbital effect because they don't penetrate the sample. So all they can do is they can really change the Zeeman coupling. So as you go from black to red, you can see that the Zeeman coupling is what is increasing. The perpendicular field is remaining the same. So if I look at, can you guys see my cursor here? Okay, I hope you can. Um, so anyway, so if you get the... Sample, yes, we can see your cursor. Okay, thank you. So if you get the sample into the region where it is nu equals zero, you can see that the two terminal conductance, and I'm going to explain to you exactly what that is in a second, the two terminal conductance vanishes in the range of fillings that corresponds to nu equals zero, okay, at perpendicular field. As you increase the Zeeman, it turns out this, the two terminal conductance increases, and eventually it goes towards some value, which is two times e squared over h. Okay, so let's see what this, what this actually means. Okay, so this is the actual experiment. So let's see what this means. So if I had a helical Luttinger liquid, then each edge of the sample would have a upward propagating mode with upspin and a downward propagating mode with downspin on one edge and the other way on the other edge. Now imagine that I have a source at the bottom, that's this thing that I call S, and I had a drain at the top in my sample and I biased the source. So I'm trying to drive a current from source to drain. Now there's only one channel on the right hand edge that can carry the current in the direction I want it to. And that's the red channel. On the left hand edge, I have the green channel. So there are actually two quantum channels that can carry current from the source to the drain. And so therefore the two terminal conductance of this non-interacting state should be two times E squared over H. Okay, so what the experiment, let's go back to that, says that when I put the Zeeman coupling to be very, very large, look at this, it's 35 Tesla. Okay, so I, when I make it huge, then it tends towards that state that I thought was the natural non-interacting state or the natural state when I have pure Coulomb interactions, okay? On the other hand, when I had only a perpendicular field, then this state has a zero two terminal conductance. And what that means is there are basically no edges. There are no protected edges in the system. So then the question becomes, okay, if it's not the state that we thought it was, which was a fully polarized state, what is it? Okay, so that, that is the question that was posed in 2014. It had actually been answered in a sense even before 2014 in 2012 by Karitonov. But let's go back and review or recall what we already know about the interactions. Okay, so in general, if I project to the lowest Landau level, right? What I can have are three kinds of interactions. I can have something that is a pure density density, okay? I can have something that looks like a tau z tau z. This, remember, this is the valley space, which is the same in the n equals zero Landau levels as the sub lattice space. So they're the same. And you can have something that looks like an in-plane coupling in the valley space. And th those, are, those are what correspond to these orange lines that take you, take a particle from one valley to another valley. And then of course, another particle goes back from the K to the K prime, thereby conserving momentum. Okay, so these are the three kinds of interactions you can have. Now, the most natural assumption in trying to solve this problem 
is to say that, well, these interactions are inherited basically from graphene at zero magnetic field. Graphene at zero magnetic field can have the Coulomb interaction, but the Coulomb interaction, the long range part of the Coulomb interaction is this, this U zero, and it turns out it does not select any particular ground state. In this particular term, this term here, actually has an SU2 valley and an SU2 spin symmetry. So it doesn't tell the system which way to point in the spin valley space. So even though it's the largest interaction there is, this one, the Coulomb interaction, it actually doesn't help you to pick a ground state among the myriad possibilities. So to do that, you have to appeal to these two guys. And these two guys are much smaller than the Coulomb interaction. However, they happen at the lattice scale. Okay, so you say to yourself, the most natural thing is these guys are at the lattice scale. When I put on a magnetic field, the size of the orbitals is of the order of the magnetic length, which is much, much larger than the lattice, lattice scale. Okay, so therefore, I can effectively think of these interactions as being very, very short range indeed, this UZ and the UXY. So that's the most natural assumption. And that is, in fact, what was assumed by Karitonov in his 2012 work. This is a theoretical work. So what he did was he assumed ultra short range interactions, which means that that UZ and the UXY, which he calls U perp, are basically delta functions on the scale of the magnetic length. OK, and so this is what he assumed. And the phase diagram he got from Hartree Falk is what I've shown here. So this is the fully polarized. So indeed, it does happen for some choice of UZ and UPERP. There's an antiferromagnet if UZ is positive and UPERP is negative. And then there's also this thing which is bond ordered, and he called it a Kekulé distorted phase. That is one of the possible bond orders. Of course, there are other possible bond orders. But regardless, this is a bond ordered phase, this yellow phase here. And then if you put negative values of UZ, then the system wants to order in a charge density way. So these are the four phases that Haritono found. And uh, this was without any Zeeman coupling. If you added a Zeeman coupling, then pretty much what you expected to happen would happen. The antiferromagnet would actually become a canted antiferromagnet. So the antiferromagnet looks like that. So the A sublattice, let's say, has a spin pointing in this direction. The B sublattice has it pointing in that direction. If I add a Zeeman, then these two guys would still like to be antiferromagnetic because of their interactions. But then they also want to take advantage of some of the Zeeman coupling. So they would like to point a little bit in the direction of the Zeeman, and so they tilt upwards. So this kind of a phase is called a canted antiferromagnet. And as I jack up the Zeeman more and more, these guys will cant out more and more until eventually at some critical value of Zeeman, they will both point in the same direction. And so if I travel, if I sit somewhere here and I jack up the Zeeman, effectively what I'm doing is I'm making a transition into the ferro or the fully polarized phase. Really rather what's happening of course is that the transition line, this green or this sorry blue dotted line is moving to the left and it comes and crosses the point that I'm sitting at. And that is how, as you increase the Zeeman coupling, and remember in the experiment that was done with an in-plane field, as I increase the in-plane field, the, what, what used to be an antiferromagnet actually makes a transition to the fully polarized state. So this seems to be a fairly good description of what's going on in the experiment. And uh, as soon as the experiment was done, it was believed at that time, and it's still believed that this is what is going on. Okay, so experimentally, there is evidence for this, which is that the first experiment, the, the, the Young et al., the Andrea Young experiment, sees a continuous phase transition between the canted antiferromagnet and the fully polarized phase, and that's easy to understand using those pictures that I, that I drew about how the spins can't. There's also some other kinds of experiments that support the, 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 the fact that there are some spin excitations in this nu equals zero phase at small Zeeman. 
Okay, and that has to do with the transmission of magnons through this mu equals zero state. And so the fact that it can transmit magnons means that there are some spin excitations. Now, the problem is that the gaplessness of these magnons cannot really be seen by this type of experiment because the way that these magnons are produced is in some other quantum Hall state and the only place they can be produced, only energy with which they can be produced is above the Zeeman energy. So anyway, there's, there's some evidence that it has, it's, it's, it's spin active, this nuclear zero state, and it has a second order phase transition to the fully polarized state. And now there's a sort of a, not a contradiction, but a complication that was introduced in 2019 by this measurement by people at Beijing Normal University. And what they show is that if they do STM on this graphene at nu equals zero, they find evidence for bond order. So you can actually see it. So uh, there are some dark spots, some light bands. So each of these things is a honeycomb. And there are some, some intense bonds and there are some non-intense bonds. OK. So, excuse me, STM is scanning tunnel microscopy or something, or what? That is correct. I'm sorry. This is one of those things where. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Yes. So, scanning tunnel microscopy, you have an open surface, surface open to vacuum, and then you bring a, a metallic tip down and you try to tunnel electrons into the substrate, into, sorry, into your sample. Okay. And uh, you can actually measure the current. And you can you can measure the distance to your substrate very accurately. So you can see where in the sample there are electronic states that you can tunnel into. And that at, at, at in, in, in one particular way of operating the scanning tunneling microscope, you can actually get a electron density map. And that's what these guys did. And what they found was that the electron density actually does seem to cluster to, 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 to have a bigger density on some of these bonds. And you can see there's sort of alternating, you know, more dense bonds and less dense bonds. And this is the pattern that is called the Kekulé pattern. So they do seem to find some evidence of bond order in the state that is nominally believed to be a canted antiferromagnet. Okay, so there's not exactly a contradiction. But it is a complication. And the reason it's a complication is because if you go back to Caritono's phase diagram, then there is no coexistence between the bond ordered phase, the Kekulé distorted phase, and the antiferromagnetic phase. And there's no, this, this doesn't exist even when you add a Zeeman coupling. Okay, so at this level, there is a puzzle, I would say, for theory. Okay, and the story that I'm going to tell you is a simple way to resolve this puzzle, which of course leads to its own predictions and, and so on. Okay, so the most obvious possibility is that there's a coexistence of bond order and canted antiferromagnetic order. Okay, now let's see where, 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 what are the loopholes in what Haritono did. Okay, so let me remind you, Haritono assumed an ultra short range interaction. Okay, again, what that means is you go back here and uh, you say this U0 does not allow you to discriminate between the different ground states. So you throw it out, even though it's the largest of all the interaction scales. So there are these two others, and um, these you assume, if you assume that they're inherited from the lattice, then they're acting at the lattice scale. They're short range interactions at the lattice scale. And then you just project them down to your n equals zero manifold of Landau levels. And if you do that, because the magnetic length is much larger than the lattice spacing, you will get a very short range interaction. And then you have, you're forced to have the same conclusions that Kurtono did. So what is the way out? Well, it turns out that of course, you can't just project your interaction down. What you really need to do is you need to integrate out the higher energy states and you need to understand what you get. In fact, Karitonov himself did something like that 
in order to justify the sign of one of those couplings, the ones that he, the one that he calls U perpendicular, it has a negative sign, and then it, it's actually not obvious why that sign is negative. And then he worked out some sequence of renormalization group transformations integrating out higher energy states, including phonons and so on. And he found that you know under certain conditions, in fact, it is possible to get a negative value for that coupling, which seems to be what the real samples are in. So some kind of renormalization is indeed involved. The question is, can that kind of renormalization give you the, the, the structure that you need in terms of these interaction functions that makes them non-ultra short range? OK, so here it is. So what you have is basically these three types of couplings, okay, where mu corresponds to this tau mu. Again, this is a Pauli in the space of sublattice or valley, the same in the n equals zero lambda levels. And uh, if you assume it to be exactly short range, okay, let's back up a little bit. Now, of course, this is a whole interaction function, okay? It's a function of Q and it's got an infinite number of parameters. If you do Hartree-Fock, it turns out that only two particular combinations of this entire function ever appear in the ground state energy in Hartree fault. So what are they? One of them, which is the Hartree term, is basically the Q equals zero value of it, as you can see here. And we will call that G mu Hartree. The H is for Hartree. The exchange term is an integral over all Q against this form factor which comes from the fact that you're in the lowest Landau level, this e to the minus q squared l squared over 2. And if you do that, that is what we will call g mu Fock. If you had an ultra short range interaction, it turns out these are both exactly the same. OK, so that is what Karitonov assumed. But now we are going to have, he had three couplings, we are going to have six, because we are going to assume that the Hartree and the Fock are completely separate from each other, and I can vary each of them independently. Even if I do that, if I work in the regime which is relevant to experiments, then it turns out that three of these guys are irrelevant. They don't play any role in the ground state energy. So we are left with three, okay? So here's a result from, by choosing some particular value for those three couplings, I can tell you exactly what values they are if you're interested, but it doesn't matter really. The point is that there are some values of those three relevant interactions that I can choose, couplings that I can choose, for which there is some coexistence, there's some region of coexistence as I change the Zeeman energy. Okay, so the x-axis is the Zeeman energy, the y-axis is the, is the two different order parameters, the three different order parameters that I have. So this green stuff here is actually the bond order. Okay, so you can see that at zero Zeeman energy for this particular choice of my parameters, G mu, Hartree and Fock, it's actually bond ordered. And as I start increasing the Zeeman, it goes into a region of Zeeman where there's a coexistence between the bond order and this canted antiferromagnet. So this red stuff here is the canted antiferromagnet. Beyond a certain critical value of the Zeeman, the bond order disappears and you have only the canted antiferromagnet. And eventually that also dies off and you have just a fully polarized state. Okay, so it is possible. That's what we have ascertained by allowing the Hartree and the Fock parts of these interactions to vary independently. Okay, and here's a different view of the phase diagram. So I'm sorry about the, the axes here. This is GZ Fock. This is GXY Hartree. What I've done in this picture is to fix GXY Fock to be minus one. It always has to be negative, this particular coupling, in order to obtain the canted antiferromagnet at all. Okay. So as I change GXY Hartree, so this is some section through the phase diagram that I'm taking. As I change GXY Hartree, you can see that there's a region of coexistence that opens up between the bond order and the canted antiferromagnet. So what we decide, what we found 
in doing our calculation is that in order to have this coexistence, you really need to have the fork part of this GXY, this in-plane coupling, to be larger in magnitude than the Hartree part. And you also need a non-zero Zeeman coupling. So those are the two things that you need in order to make this work. Now, is it reasonable? Well, we don't know that it's reasonable. So what, 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 what is really necessary in order to have this happen? The Hartree part, remember, is the Q equals zero value of this coupling. So what you really need is something that is non-monotonic in Q. Not only should it be non-monotonic in Q, the structure, okay, the, the, the scale of the non-monotonicity should actually be on the scale of the magnetic length. It is possible to get something like this because remember you had these Landau levels, right? So you had your N equals zero Landau level, you had your N equals one here, you had your N equals minus one, and then they got closer and closer, you had N equals two, blah, blah, blah. And uh, if you integrate out the higher Landau levels, not assuming that they all form part of the continuum that was the zero field graphene. If you keep them discrete, then some term like this, some diagram like this will actually give you a part of the interaction, the anomalized interaction that actually depends upon the magnetic length scale that varies on the scale of the magnetic length. So it is possible. What we've not done is a systematic kind of RG that shows you that if you do this, then what you get will actually be the correct type of interaction to give you the coexistence. So what we did was something that's sort of the next best. Actually, maybe even better than next best. So what we said was, let's go to the lattice. Okay, so let's keep the lattice. Now on the lattice, you wanna put an orbital flux. Now you can only do it and keep your translation invariance if you put a fraction, a rational number of quanta of flux per original unit cell per, he per hexagon. Okay, because then what you can do is you can increase your unit cell to what is called a magnetic unit cell that has an integer number of flux quanta and that allows you to choose two different commuting translations. So you still have a case space, you still have a Brillouin zone, you still have all the nice things, and then you can put in some interacting Hamiltonian that you think is natural, say an on-site Hubbard and nearest neighbor spin-spin interactions, Heisenberg spin-spin, and then you just carry out Hartree fall. And that is what we did. In fact, there has been previous work, not at the level of what we did. So I've already told you about the Caritono work. There's also other work in the continuum. Okay, and um, there's, there's lattice work that had only a Hubbard interaction. Okay, they did not have the spin-spin interaction and they never found a bond ordered state. So it's very hard to find bond ordered states in a lattice calculation, it turns out. Okay, now a spinless version of the model that we studied was actually studied by Archana Mishra and collaborators. I think Bhaskaran was also involved in this. So, um, they found various states, but the, the, the model we are interested in is actually graphene, which is spin full. So here it is. This is kind of what you do. Okay, so I've shown it for Q equals three. You choose some gauge on this lattice such that you have a fraction of a flux quantum going through each honeycomb. And then you choose your extended unit cell. You choose your L1 zone, blah, blah, blah. There's some beautiful non-interacting physics as well. So for example, the two, the, the, the N equals zero manifold is that central set of states that are touching each other. So we studied the sequence of flux being one over Q, where Q is an integer. And for that sequence, it turns out there are two Q touchings, Dirac touchings in the lowest two bands. So it's those two bands that are right at the center that become the N equals zero lambda level manifold. And there's some interesting non-interacting physics there as well, but let's forget about that and go to the interacting phase diagram. So we have done it all the way up to Q equals four. Hey, excuse me. Yeah. Could, could you go back? What was that beautiful picture of the Hofstadter butterfly before that? Yeah, what's this? this? 
Right. So this is the Hofstra butterfly for the honeycomb ladder. Okay. So this is a non-interacting system with various amounts of flux. And anytime there's a gap, so any any place in this, you know, uh, flux versus filling. So one. So let's say the x-axis is the total amount of flux that you're putting through each honeycomb. Okay. If you put a single unit of flux through the honeycomb, then it's periodic because it's a lattice system, and one unit of flux can be gauged away in a, in a, in a, a, around a honeycomb. So all you want to do is go all the way to one flux quantum, and then on the vertical axis is the filling. Okay, and you know how many particles per site are you filling? So anytime you have a gap, you actually have a churn number of all the filled bands. And this this colored Hofstadter butterfly is a plot of what the churn numbers look like at various points, at various gapped states. Okay, so it's it's a, this is this is from Agassi et al. I think it was like 2014 or something like that. Okay, so yeah, there's some some very beautiful, more interesting. Things. Yeah. Question. And it has some fractal structure, obviously. Right, right, right. Because you see, um, you know, you can make fractions with very different denominators, but which are very, very close to each other in, in terms of real numbers, right? So there is some fractal structure. And, and this is true even of the, the, the old half starter butterfly on the square lattice. So there's always some fractal structure in some regions of the half starter butterfly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so here's our interacting Hartree Fock phase diagram for a particular value of flux. So, one twelfth of a flux quantum going through every honeycomb. Okay, so you can see there's a whole bunch of phases. There's a whole mess of phases that never appeared in the continuum phase diagram of Karitonov, which for comparison is right here. Okay, so Karitonov has only four. And uh, let me also remark that these two couplings that Karitonov has, uz and u perp, you can actually map them linearly onto the two couplings that we have. And that's the Hubbard interaction u and this Heisenberg spin spin interaction g. Okay. And so those are the two natural interactions you can write down for a spin full model, two short range interactions. Remember, these interactions are also lattice scale. Okay. So there's a whole mess of phases, okay, lots more phases than Karitonov gets. And one of the things that we found was that bond order seems to be ubiquitous. It's there everywhere, okay, except for this fully ferromagnetic phase that is sitting over here. It's there almost everywhere else. Okay, any other kind of order, like a spin density wave, which is also jargon for antiferromagnet, okay? You, this is an antiferromagnetic phase, this whole region out here, that also has bond order, okay? And this is one kind of bond order, there's some other kind of bond order, there's a third kind of bond order, this is a charge density wave phase with some completely different kind of bond order, and so on and so forth. So it turns out that a lot of these phases, as you change the value of Q, they kind of shrink, they change their nature, and so on and so forth. The ones that truly survive, that seem to exist over all the Qs, that we have studied are this guy, this guy, this E, D, the charge density wave, C, and B. Okay, so those are the ones that seem to exist also in Karitonov, except for this one here. This E does not seem to exist. There's a direct transition between the F and the CDW phases. This Kekulé distorted, what he calls Kekulé distorted, is what we think this C is. It is not a Kekulé order, it's some other kind of order, but you know, this bond order. And this region here is what we believe corresponds to his antiferromagnet because it's a charge dense, uh, sorry, it's a spin density wave, which is an antiferromagnet. Okay, so far so good. Now, this is for zero Zeeman. Now what we're gonna do is turn on the Zeeman. Okay, so so this these are the, 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 the kinds of things that I already talked about. So we don't need to talk about them again. If you turn on the Zeeman, something interesting happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit at a point in that lattice phase diagram where we have antiferromagnetism or spin density wave. And remember, for all the cues that we studied, this spin density wave comes with bond order of some particular type. 
And then we're going to sit in a place that has this, and then we're going to turn on the Zeeman coupling and ask what happens. Now, of course, for different values of Q, slightly different things will happen, but you can try to extrapolate. You can ask yourself what happens in the limit as Q tends to infinity. Okay, so that's what we did. So we found two different regions. Okay, so for small Zeeman, we found that in the Q goes to infinity limit, which is essentially the limit of very weak magnetic fields on the lattice scale. Okay, just for your, you know, just to keep in mind, a field of, let's say, 10 Tesla in, in a real sample of graphene corresponds to something like a Q of 10,000, okay? So we have gone to a Q of 36, right? So we're extrapolating to a Q of about 10,000, which is the realistic fields. So that's what we mean by the Q goes to infinity limit. So if we do that, what we find, and here are the, 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 the two graphs on the right are the extrapolations, how we did the extrapolations. Regardless, what you find is that for small values of Zeeman, there seems to be a robust coexistence of canted and bond order. So canted antiferromagnet and bond order do coexist, at least in the lattice in the Hartree-Fock approximation. Now, as you increase the Zeeman, you get another phase in which the canted is non-zero, but the bond order disappears. So if you recall, this is the same as we found in the continuum, when we let the Hartree part and the Fock part of the two different couplings vary independently, that is also what we got. Okay, so this kind of, kind of lends us some hope that what we did in the continuum is actually not that unreasonable. So somehow, because the lattice, we are treating the, in all the set of states, the entire Hilbert space of the lattice model. And that means that we are keeping all the Landau level mixing and all the putative renormalizations, blah, 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 that have to happen, at least at the Hartree Fock level, we are keeping them. And so that is somehow leading to this coexistence, which in the effective theory of only the n equals zero manifold means that it must have structure. All those interaction functions must have structure on the scale of the magnetic length. So here are my conclusions, okay? So there always seems to be a coexistence of bond order and antiferromagnetism in the regime in which the real samples are likely to be. When, when the Zeeman vanishes, this always seems to happen. Now, as you increase the Zeeman, there are two transitions. The problem is that the first transition from the bond order and antiferromagnet coexisting to only the canted antiferromagnet both of those phases are insulators. They don't have any edge states. So there will be no transport signature. The only way to find out is to put something, one of these samples in a parallel field, change the Zeeman, and then do your scanning tunneling microscopy and see that the bond order disappears at a critical value of Zeeman first, and then it becomes fully polarized, okay? One thing we haven't included here is disorder. So we include disorder, disorder breaks translation invariance. So any state that spontaneously breaks translation will be favored by disorder. And so this is likely to increase the domain over which bond order is seen. So the biggest open question is, everything here has been done in Hartree Fock. Okay, so in fact, we don't know what the, what the real ground states of this model look like. So this, there's, a, there's a good opportunity here for somebody to do a real unbiased lattice calculation, okay, in the lattice model and, 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 and maybe hope to determine, if you have a big enough lattice, hope to determine what the real ground state is as a function of these parameters. And so this ultra short training assumption that, that, that has been made often in all these graphene materials may actually uh, need to be revisited. And there are similar questions that happen in, in, in wild semi-metals. So let me just flash one slide and then I will stop. So this is something that uh, uh, one of some of these students who is Farooq and Ankur, who's my former student, now a postdoc at the Weizmann, Sumati and, and, and I have just put out on the archive. And this is uh, completely non-interacting. Here's a wild semi-metal and it's put into an orbital flux. And you ask what happens? What are the different phases? 
and you can see there's a whole bunch of phases. There's a mess of phases. The white is just a trivial insulator. The orange is a layered churn insulator. And then you have a mess of different wild states, wild phases, with different numbers of wild nodes. Okay, so anytime you have this kind of structure and you turn on interactions, so there's something similar, I hope, happening in 3D as happens in 2D. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very uh, pretty talk. Are there questions, please? Um, it, 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 if I could be, could you remind me what the order parameter for bond order is? Is it just like occupation number on, you know, between different sites? Right. So, very good. So at the level of this effective theory, what happens is that, let me go back to your, to your interaction here. So, right. So what happens at the level of the effective theory is that you want there to be a coherence between the two different valleys. Okay, so let me actually draw it somewhere here. So at the non-interacting level, there are two valleys here. Right. What you want is you want to develop an order parameter that says there's C dagger of KS, C, K prime S. Okay, this is what you want. And this actually breaks the translation symmetry of the original ladder, right? Because these two are a different momenta. And so you're breaking translation invariance. So there's a larger unit star that now you can find, and then there's a there's a there's a structure in the larger unit. That is what bond order corresponds to. So it's breaking the symmetry between the two um, cones. Yes, it's 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 producing an interlayer coherence. It's actually breaking translation invariance. That's really what it's breaking. Yeah. yeah. Spontaneous okay. breaking of Yeah. 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 Very good. And good. Could I ask you what was the magnetic length again? It, that presumably gets small as the magnetic field gets big. Very good. So the magnetic length is this, okay? And if you have a field of one Tesla, the magnetic length is roughly 25 nanometers. Just for comparison, the lattice size is 1.5 angstrom in graphene. So it's a, it's a couple of orders of magnitude. I see. So then I'd need much, if I wanted to go to smaller L, I'd need much bigger B and I can't get exactly. much bigger so B. If you wanted to really get into the half starter regime, then you'd need to go to 10,000 Tesla. 10,000, okay. <laughs> That's not, maybe, yeah, maybe, okay. Maybe you can find me a neutron star that'll do that. Yeah, yeah, even the, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, that's a, very good, very good, okay. Are there uh, other questions, please? Hey, Ganpati, uh, so uh, I had a question that, uh, can you write a, can you write a field theory of these uh, kind of um, problems or is it not possible to do that? Because you are mentioning about short range interactions in these kind of very good, very uh, good. So, system. So, so, yeah, I, I think if I understand your question correctly, I think what you're asking is, can I write down some kind of a Landau-Ginsberg model of this phase transition? Is that what you're asking? Or is that the wrong question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Or uh, maybe in the Hamiltonian, can I write it in terms of some continuous variables? and. Some, some kind of a field theory kind, kind of thing. Or even, uh, yeah, if you can think of in the landau Ginsburg picture is fine. Right. Because you're yeah. concerned about phase transitions. Yeah. Right. So in the landau Ginsburg picture, I think, you know, you can write down some, some two order parameters. So let's say there's a phi bond order and then there's a phi antiferromagnet. Okay. I'm going to, you know, just write them as scalars, even though they're not scalars, right? So they, they, they have some, some other structure, depending on their, their lattice symmetries and so on. But let's just, you know, for simplicity, let's write them like this. And then, of course, there's, you know, some usual stuff, right? This squared plus, you know, R by bond order squared, right? Plus some lambda bond order 
five bond order to the fourth and, and so on and so forth, right? And the same thing for antiferromagnetic. Now, in general, when you have multiple order parameters, you can have something that, that, that couples the two order parameters. Okay, now, because these two guys have very different symmetries, right? One of them breaks time reversal, which is the antiferromagnetic order, right? And then this guy doesn't, it's just bond order. So normally the only kind of coupling that's allowed is, is something that looks like bond order squared antiferromagnet square. Okay, this is what you would write down in a Landau-like theory of this phase transition. So what we're saying is that when this guy, typically when u is bigger than zero, then, you know, when you go, when you try to go from one to the other, so these two order parameters repel each other. In other words, if I, if I have one of these order parameters, then the other order parameter becomes less likely to happen. Okay, it, it contributes to the R. So in other words, if I already have an antiferromagnetic order, then this adds to the U and it makes it, remember this R has to turn negative in order for, the, for, for there to be a spontaneous order parameter of the bond order type, okay? So if U is bigger than zero, then there'll be typically a first order transition between the two. If U is less than zero, then there's a second order transition. So what we infer from the continuum model that we wrote down and we solved in Hartree-Fock, what we infer is that this U is somehow proportional to, you know, GXY Fock minus GXY Hartree, okay? This is what we surmise from that. Now, if you really wanted to write down a Landau theory of this, unfortunately, it's very complicated because there are you'd have to take into account the different types of translation symmetry breaking, right? That the bond order can have. And they break different kinds of lattice symmetry. Some of them break translations, but not rotations, not the C3 rotations. Some of them break both translations and the C3 rotations and so on. Okay, so that Landau theory is a very complicated Landau theory. It has lots and lots of different order parameters. And we have not done that. Yeah, but that is that is something something interesting to think about. Actually, if I could ask a related question, could you go back to your one of your last figures with the phase diagram of where you had the ferromagnetic, the bond order before that, before that, before that? Uh, no, you, you had one where it was just a linear scale and then it, it had ferromagnetic all the way to the right, and then the other phases. Yes, yes, yes. So, because uh -huh. what I found interesting is that if you have, well, I guess if you have pure ferromagnetic, then everything else gets scunched out. But exactly. what I found fascinating is this intermediate region where you could have what? For a limit, you could have three phases for an intermediate. That right. was fascinating. So th right. that means the right. Landau Ginsburg must be really complicated. The La Landau Ginsburg is very complicated. That is right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, is... it's, you have to yeah. balance it between them. But it's very interesting right. that you could have right. both. Can, I, I can, you can understand the competition between antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic. But yes. how that relates to bond order isn't, or can't it antiferromagnetic? To bond order isn't obvious, is it? Right, it is not obvious. Is so the, the way you would think about it in Hartree Fock is you would have this matrix of expectation values, right? So you would have something that looks like, you know, alpha, which is like you know, valley index, and then, you know, S, and then C, beta, S prime, something like this. So this would be like a four by four matrix, and then you start filling mm -hmm. it out, and then you ask where are the, so the antiferromagnet looks something like, you know, there, there's something here, something there, something there, and something there. And then there's something here and minus that something, minus something here. Okay, that's where the antiferromagnet is. The bond okay. order, so the K value, and this is the K prime value. So this is K up, K down, and up, K prime down. And so the, the, the bond order says that there, there are things here. Okay, so it's a different structure. And so, mm -hmm. in principle, what your constraints are, are that you have to fill up 
two complete Landau levels. But those two Landau levels are arbitrary linear combination of K up, K down, K prime up, K prime down. Okay, and, and, and the one with the lowest energy wins. So it's, if it's fully polarized, then of course, both of the ones you fill up have to have upspin. And the only two different ones you have are K up and up. And that is why there's no room left over for any other order parameter. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, we're, we're usually used to considering systems where we just consider the lowest Landau level. And clearly, right. when you have right. more than one, it just right. the wealth right. of possibilities. Yes, is enormous. Expands. Yeah. Very good. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, please speak up if you do. If not, last chance. Let's thank Professor Murthy for mm -hmm. a very nice talk. And with that, we end the session for today. And uh, so I'll, we will see all of you tomorrow. Uh, Sayam Tom, do you have, or Sumati Soren, do you have anything else to add? No, nothing more, but just wanted to thank Ganpati for this. Very good. Let's thank all of the speakers today. And um, also to, uh, if the speakers are here to put their, there's been several requests to put their talks on the um, website or in the Slack, somewhere where the students can get at them. Very good. Well, so with that, I'll end today's session. Thank you very much. To those in India, sleep well. Those of us elsewhere, see you tomorrow. Goodbye.